Great to see everyone here. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the what is the inaugural Gilbert S. Oman, MD, 61, and Martha A. Darling, 70, lecture in ethics and policy in bioengineering. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and to start this this new lecture. Um, I'll just say a couple words about uh, about the, the background here. Um, two years ago, we launched the Princeton Bioengineering Initiative, and uh, the goal of this was to support and expand um, existing activities and grow new activities at the interface of engineering and the life sciences. Um, bioengineering, as you all probably know, is having a huge impact on society. Um, we're all aware that the pandemic has disrupted every aspect of, of our lives over the last several years, and uh, our ability to combat uh, COVID-19 through uh, vaccines and antivirals and, and uh, related technologies. So just one example of the, you know, this inter interface between life sciences and, and, and engineering and, and the impact that it's you know, in every one of our daily lives, that's only going to expand uh, dramatically in the coming years. Um, so, um, yeah, we think it's critical to have conversations on campus about bioengineering and the societal impacts with respect to uh, ethics and philosophical implications and policy and really can think of no better place than Princeton to have those conversations, a, a place that's you know, steeped in liberal arts and, and uh, colleagues um, uh, in many different areas that want to think about these kinds of questions. Uh, so we in bioengineering, together with the University Center for Human Values and the Council on Science and Technology, uh, decide to put together um, an annual uh, lecture on, on, on bioethics. And, uh, and that's what we're starting today. And so it's really exciting to welcome you all to that. Um, I want to say special thanks to some of the people that uh, really helped organize this, in particular uh, Penelope Georges, uh, Mike Chekovich, and Jimlin Pablacio. have uh, been really essential for the logistics of making this happen, including the, uh, the reception we're going to have afterwards, which I uh, encourage everyone to attend um, just down the, down the hall in the atrium. Um, and of course, we're also extremely grateful to Gil Oman and, and Martha Darling, uh, who are here. We have the pleasure of uh, having them here with us today for their strong support of uh, Princeton in general and, and bioengineering in particular. Um, they, their, uh, their support has made this lecture possible and is, is uh, really playing, a, a, I think, a catalytic role in helping connect different units across campus. Um, many of the colleagues uh, in the uh, Center for Human Values and Philosophy and History I, I have not had the opportunity to, to interact with before and, and through this, uh, this event and the support. Um, myself and my colleagues in bioengineering are engaging in these new conversations, and so I think it's really exciting. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce our 2022 OMA lecturer, Jody Halpern. Uh, Jody holds an MD and PhD and is Chancellor's Chair and Professor of Bioethics at UC Berkeley. She's a faculty director of the Berkeley Group on the Ethics and Regulation of Innovative Technologies. Um, she's a, Guggen, a 2022 Guggenheim Fellow and founding steering committee member of the new Berkeley Cavley Institute for Science, Ethics, and, uh, and the Public. Uh, so Jody's research integrates philosophy and psychiatry to examine emotional influences on cognition, empathy, autonomy, and justice, and how we imagine and create innovative technologies. Um, and her newest body of research examines how technologies such as gene edi editing and artificial intelligence transform relationships <laughs> and society in unexpected ways. And um, I'll just say from a personal note, uh, Jody and I met several years ago and, and um, uh, have kept a conversation going and, and uh, she's helped us think through this lecture and uh, had some conversations with her over the summer and it's been a real pleasure interacting with you, Jody, and, and we're just so pleased to welcome you as our inaugural Omen lecturer. Thank you. Thank you, um, Gil and Martha, for supporting this interaction of bioengineering and ethics in society and giving us the opportunity to meet today. And um, I've really been, it's been really very meaningful for me to talk with you, Cliff, and learn because your area is so, I, I, you'll hear, I know a little bit about genome editing. But what you're doing is all, it's all been incredibly interesting to me and stimulated a lot of thoughts about ethics in society. And um, I've had a wonderful day with others too, so I'll thank you. 
Okay, well, let me get started. Um, my title is From Bench to Bedside, Shifting, and you can tell me if there's trouble hearing, Shifting Societal and Ethical Responsibilities for Bioengineers. So a very important part of bioengineering is that it's a field that moves very either quickly or slowly, but is directed towards translation. Translation is taking basic science and turning it into actual products that can be useful in the world. And the products I've been more interested in are related to medicine and health. And bioengineers in these areas are really shaping translation and with impact on the global future. Imagine it's 2045 and there are two distinct groups of people. The wealthy, who are gene edited with the PSK9 gene, which resists cholesterol and cardiac disease, who live till 95 free of cardiac disease, and everyone else whose lifespan is to age 65 with strokes and cardiac disease. Or imagine it's 2045 and global cooperation and funding provide PSK9 gene editing internationally so that people around the world no longer die from cholesterol-related illnesses. The difference between, in my view, these two scenarios playing out will be heavily affected by bioengineers themselves engaging at the beginning of their work upstream in thinking about ethics in society. Why am I interested in this? Okay, well, Cliff told you a little bit about me, but I'm a philosopher uh, who studies how emotions shape our beliefs, and I'm a psychoanalytic psychiatrist who studies how our unconscious beliefs and expectations shape what we produce and what we make. So first of all, the question that interested me in this area is how do limitations in our ethical imagination and our biases shape everyday medical and research decisions? For example, a very important area in medical research is clinical trials. And for cancer drugs, for example, uh, we have fa four phases of clinical trials. And the first phase is before we have any idea if this drug will do anything to help anybody. It's been tested somewhat in animals for safety and a little bit for efficacy, but not enough. And the first phase is when we ask volunteers with end-stage cancers, people, to go to the NIH or wherever and sign up and spend what very well maybe the last six months or year of their life in a toxicity trial, where our goal is really to see how much we can give them before they get really severely ill. So mo many of people in the trial will get ill and that will take up the last year of their life. And the reason that people sign up for these trials is overwhelmingly because they believe the trials will cure them of their cancer. But the odds of them being cured from cancer in these trials is in the 1%, 2% range, not even cured, even having a few months of extended life. Um, and it's very rare to see a cure. There was one period with lymphomas, but it's almost never happened in a phase one trial, which is different than later trials, phase two, phase three. And the people in the trials, when they've been interviewed, we did a study of this and others have too, 90 to 95% of the people believe they'll be cured, even though that's the facts are against it. And those folks come from across the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, there are people who are MD, PhDs, who believe that they will be cured. It's a psychological phenomenon. So how is that shaping how we should work with people now with innovative technologies when we have early phase trials where we don't know what we're offering people? The second question, and that's every, I call that everyday medical and research decisions because it's happening before we have very new things with bioengineering, but it will be affect bioengineering a lot, as I'll talk about. The second question, though, is when we have much more radical medical and research possibilities and decisions, how do limitations in our ethical imagination and our biases shape those? And I'm going to talk today about the example of germline genome editing. And third, I'm interested in this because of co-founding this Kavli Center for Ethics, Science, and the Public, where we're really committed to creating the time and the career advancement possibilities for bioengineers to seriously engage with the ethics and the social science, and for having people in ethics, social sciences, and other fields seriously engage in the science. First of all, in terms of methods for studying this, I think it's very important that we do contextualized research. Study people in the lab, study people in the clinics, in the phase one trials, and see how do people really make these decisions. I find that without that, 
what we see is a lot of public a lot of public generalities about bioengineering and a kind of oscillation between extremes of very generic techno-optimism and very generic precautionary principles. So techno-optimism is the belief that we can solve everything with technology and engineering. And a very good example of that being unrealistic was Mark Zuckerberg early on when he was about 28, thinking that Facebook would unite the world socially. <laughs> and uh, we actually had historical research at that time that the, that the telegram was, the tr was one of the triggers for World War I and the radio one of the causes of World War II. So he could have thought more about it. But, um, but there's a lot of techno-optimism to this day where people really think, gee, if we just come up with this gizmo, we'll solve all these very complex human issues. But on the other side, ethicists especially, uh, uh, bring in something just as generic, which is the precautionary principle, which is not really a principle. It's not based on reasoned argumentation, but it's a warning to be careful. And being careful is important. That's why we have, we could use more regulation, frankly, in the United States, but we have the FDA and other things. But it's not that we don't need to be careful, but it doesn't really tell you what to do when all the things we're inventing now are going to have such a wide range of unpredictable applications that if we wait till we are absolutely certain that nothing could ever cause any harm, we'd have to shut down all our labs now. So because those oscillations are insufficient, I'd much rather study specific applications or specific science endeavors, specific societal needs, and see how thoughtful people are in enacting the science and engaging the public and patients, et cetera, in that. And again, I, as I said, I, I am personally, some people think that the bioengineers themselves have no role in this ethical thinking, and I don't agree with that at all, and I'll say more about why. Um, because that's where upstream in the lab is where things get invented. So I think it's very important for bioengineers to actually have as part of being a, to be a, I would love to see it, that you would not be called a good bioengineer and win a Nobel Prize or whatever, if you weren't considered to be somebody who was also thoughtful about the ethics and the societal parts, as well as doing highly innovative science. And I would argue that this is going to be essential for earning and sustaining public trust. OK, so what I'm going to present to you is some of our research in two areas. They're both case studies from genome editing. They're both happened because of this technology called CRISPR. I'm going to save my voice and let you le read that paragraph yourself. But I can just tell you that for those not involved, CRISPR you know, involves what's basically, think of it as, as, as a, a microscopic scissor. Um, it has to do with, it's developed from bacteria that when they're infected by a virus, they make a DNA sort of snapshot of that virus so that they can create an immune response to it next time they're invaded. So it's sort of, I was going to say, it's like a picture in the post office of a wanted, somebody's wanted for a crime, but I realized generationally no one's going to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And there's actually a radio lab about that. You can watch Radio Lab if you want. There's a great Radio Lab on CRISPR. But I hope everybody will let me just stick with that. Um, it allows very precise editing of DNA, and it's very efficient and very inexpensive. There's two kinds of cells in the body, period. So we can edit only two kinds of cells, somatic cells and germline cells. Germline are eggs and sperm cells. If you edit those, that gets passed on to all your progeny. Every other cell in the body is a somatic cell. I'm going to talk about our work in what I'm calling the quote everyday ethics, but very important, um, which is our study of somatic cell clinical trials, where lab scientists engage with human subjects research for the first time. And then I'm going to talk about the radical ethics. Germline genome editing is changing, that would change future generations, is now seriously um, possible and being considered and would break longstanding rules, and it's spurring international debate. OK, so how did I get interested in the ethics challenges of somatic cell genome editing? I'm at UC Berkeley. That's where Jennifer Doudna, who is one of the discoverers of CRISPR, um, we think she is the discoverer of CRISPR. But I mean, I don't know how Harvard people that are here, and I don't want to get into debate. Um, but uh, she, she's there. And she and Jacob Korn, her co-PI, were by 2016, CRISPR was all in the news. And they started receiving letters from patients and families with very serious genetic diseases, sort of desperately seeking cures, writing to them you know, about their hardship and their lives, and saying, you know, when can I expect a cure for my child? My 
family. And they, to my endless being impressed with them, and that got me interested in working with them, they, they found me, because I'm the Berkeley bioethicist, and I had written about these trials, about phase one trials and people having this mistaken belief that a trial will cure them. And they asked for my help about how to, what they should say in the letters back to these patients and families. What do you tell people when they're saying, you know, we're desperate, when, there, when will there be a cure? What kind of timeline? And again, the humility at that point was that they said, we're trained in chemistry and, and physics. Like, we didn't, we didn't get trained in the ethics of this. Another reason that I got involved is uh, around the time, 2015, we started this Berkeley Group for Ethics and Regulation of Innovative Technologies. But in 2000, that's a group, I should say, we meet every two months, um, and we've kept it up on Zoom during COVID, and now we're going back to in person. Um, and it's really cool, because it's basically, I love the next generation and seeing people come up. And we have graduate students and postdocs in, in the bioengineering fields who come regularly and we have people in social sciences, humanities, all different fields. Um, it's not a huge group of people. We usually have about 45 people at a meeting, but it's kind of a loyal building community. We, haven't, we have to do more outreach, but I love the fact that people really are working together for about five years. And we do controversial, controversial questions, and everybody really thinks together. But at one point, we wanted to do a survey of the scientists who come. And this is interesting, because there's a selection bias of people who are ready, willing to spend time coming to ethics and society stuff. And we asked them, and they were getting involved in translation. This is important. In genome editing, bench science training st still means you're likely to get involved in, in either working with a company or starting a company or getting involved in phase one trials. They, they know they're going to be involved in all of that. And we asked them how much education they've had on your responsibilities to human subjects in research trials. And they said they really had no training in that, that they had learned about the, the ethics you learn about in a PhD program or a postdoc in these sciences and engineering fields are fraud and how to, how, how to, you know, and authorship and things that are very important, but they didn't learn anything about that stuff. So this is very important because as I was just saying, bench scientists, I, I actually had some statistics in some places it's 65%, some major universities, but I don't know if that's across the board, so I took the numbers out. But there's a lot of bench scientists moving into translation. Bench scientists have every reason to want to start companies that will conduct clinical trials. And leading universities uh, like Berkeley, we have incubators where we're basically built to encourage scientists to pursue entrepreneurship. And part of their role in, as entrepreneurs and starting companies and in that world is that bench scientists are increasingly spokespersons for cures. And it's interesting, this, this is, I brought this quote in because it's so early, 2016, but a leading genome editing scientist said very publicly, in the, in the lab we have man managed to finally create a cure for sickle cell disease. This is years before clinical trials would be even possible, and clinical trials take years to figure out if this is going to be a viable treatment in humans. I won't go into all the things with gene editing, but there are a lot of questions then about if that ca would cause immune reaction, if you would have people have mixed cells, some edited, some not. There were a lot of reasons not to say that in 2016. So those are all the reasons then that here, and here are more that I think the bioengineers need to engage with the everyday ethics. First of all, as I said, scientists are now, almost all scientists are being called to be spokespersons for cures. Um, it's part of grant writing. I mean, it's just part of the field. And that this, this can create a communicative context that get that can create cycles of hope and then mistrust. And historically, science loses public trust when they don't engage publics early on, and that's the GMO story, pretty much. That that was seen as a big mistake to not really get the public involved before GMOs were launched. And third, currently, at least in this country, there's heightened social scrutiny and distrust of good science, which is a story everyone here should know about COVID. I mean, it's a huge story right now, and there's a lot. We're having, um, oh, I forgot her name, but it's great. I think she just won a Pulitzer, a great journalist is coming to Berkeley to speak to us about it. But you know, we know that that um, good science is not trusted by more than or up to half of people in the US right now. And basically, public trust is essential for funding science. So this is a very important reason to get bioengineers engaged. OK, so this is the study we did in 2018, 
we, we wanted to study the scientists in somatic cell genome editing. We already have clinical trials. They were starting then. These were the first in human clinical trials. The kind of diseases that we first saw CRISPR used in were eye diseases and blood diseases. Because eye disease and blood disease, you can edit the genes without causing as much risk to the rest of the body. Because the eye is isolated, so if you, something happens in the eye area, it doesn't circulate to the rest of the body. And the blood, you can take the blood out of someone and gene edit it and make sure you got it right and put it back in. So we saw this for thalassemias, the sickle cell developing, and different eye diseases. And there were some other neuromuscular diseases. So those trials were starting for the very first in human use of CRISPR. And we interviewed the scientists that were involved with those who had, we had interviewed 21 bench scientists, PhDs, and 23 MD PhDs, clinician scientists. Each of our interviews was at least an hour and had two of us um, who were expert in sort of interpersonal communication and qualitative methods, two, two of us in each interview, because we really wanted to observe nonverbal communication, what people were comfortable with, what they weren't comfortable with. And we fed that back to the scientists. They were part, you know, we respected their feedback. And I want to thank my colleagues, Sharon O'Hara, Lex Owen, and Dave Palo. So we had two main research questions. The first was how do bench scientists describe their motivation for doing translational research with CRISPR? Why were all these, these were, this was of the bench scientists, why did they move from the lab into translation? And what was it about CRISPR that made them want to do that? First of all, they talked about their motive being based on CRISPR's affordability, precision, and permanence, which seemed to promise cures. A genetic change would promise a lifetime cure. And these are quotes. S is the scientist, or PS is the physician scientist. One, one, I'll just read the quotes. Tools like this, which are powerful and easy to adopt, should be really regarded as something that can save millions of people's lives. But a, then a, another scientist said, overpromising cures for diseases is something that I think academic scientists can be guilty of too. It's the nature of grant writing, right? How do we come up with revolutionary tools in biology to cure diseases? Oops. Then they began to talk to us more about how it was really essential to go into translation to get the funding to sustain their work. Our short-term considerations are completely driven by funding and money. What do the funding agencies want to fund? Which one of those can we make ourselves fit into? NIH wants to know, what companies have you talked to? Because if you say, I've talked to five companies and none of them are interested, please fund my research, I don't think so. Funding is so tight, you have to play the game. I mean, we used to just be all NIH funding and investigator initiated. Now half of my funding comes through industry partnerships. And if they, industry weren't interested, the whole field would basically die. Basically, therapeutics are where you can make the most money, and so if you're a company who's beholden to investors to try to maximize your profits, you're going to go there. So we, we saw this cycle uh, where industry funding was essential to sustain scientific work. So starting in the orange words at 8 o'clock, scientists are used to seeking NIH funding for their basic science. These genome editing scientists found that NIH would only support them if they could show industry collaboration. Industry funding focuses on translation into products and actually fairly narrowly into products. Industry provides research funding to develop new products. And then science focus on these, on these products to secure industry funding. So we saw scientists who were very much based in curiosity-driven science really shift more and more into product-driven science for, for, to sustain, to, be, to stay, to keep being scientists. One scientist, they were very reflective about this. One scientist said, in academia, for the most part, there's no way to get funding beyond a phase one trial. And actually, for these trials, that was required, the industry. It's got to be something that some company's willing to pick up, fitting into a very specific set of stories, that someday this will be a product that makes a massive profit. There has to be a story that somehow connects from today to making money. And again, this isn't the scientists saying that that's what they want, but this is saying the only way that they could, this is who they had to work with to get their work, just to continue doing their work. So then our main second question was then, what a scientist, now that they're involved in translation and all of them had some contact with um, potential research subjects, if they were giving, a lot of them give talks to disease foundations, et cetera, and they meet potential patients, 
uh, who could be research subjects, and some of them were actually meeting some of the people. They don't usually, they don't do the informed consent directly themselves, but they meet a lot of folks. So we said, what do you understand about your responsibilities to potential or actual research subjects? And that, we found that their answers to that kind of divided into two sets of things they talked to us about. When we asked them, or they talked to us about why patients should enroll in these early trials, they really emphasized the altruism of the patients that enrolled, and that those patients wanted to participate with them in producing cures for others. They said people have to understand that if they participate, they're really doing it for the greater good. Remember, this is first in human early trials, and that this will help advance these therapies. They shouldn't really expect any direct benefit. We need people to participate in these phase one trials, otherwise drugs will never get to the stage where they can be used to treat patients. I mean, that's factually true. The second, the participants in the phase one trial are not there to get cured. They're there as volunteers, part of the team, if you will, to help patients down the line receive a benefit. This, this we wondered about. And then we did ask them, because of our work showing that people enroll seeking cures in these other trials, we said, why do you think people actually enroll in the trials? And they said, basically, people enroll because they perceive that they will get a personal benefit. I've seen patients who are desperately looking for every bit of experimental therapy, and they're just so desperate already, and when this genetic solution comes out, even if it's a huge risk, they'll try it. And this is what we had seen in more traditional or immunotherapy trials. So these are obviously contradictory views. The scientists are saying when it comes to enrolling people, what they're really seeing is desperate patients seeking cures for themselves and their loved ones. But when they describe research ethics, they think it should be based on people expecting, not expecting benefits and motivated by altruism. And so we asked the scientists, that's why we spend so much time with them, how do you reconcile this contradiction? And what we saw is that the scientists didn't see this as their responsibility. They said to us, I think physicians and bioethicists should be a conduit between the scientists and the patients. So there are probably a lot of opportunities for you know some well-intentioned magical third party to come in, someone that doesn't have a conflict of interest. Or I think the FDA is a very key player here. I think the FDA is, has to serve as the de facto bioethicist. Or I don't think we're doing harm. Or I think we can make an impact as possibly in certain fields of cancer. Where I don't think we're well positioned to make an impact is on the informed consent. So just so the audience knows, in terms of the first, there is no magical third party that's going to come in. In terms of the FDA, they do not work on this. They don't look at this process of understanding and patient overestimation and informed consent process. That, that, that's the problem here. And uh, the, the impact, I don't think will make an impact on informed consent, is basically the belief that that's not part of my concern. So there's basically this view that this should be outsourced. And I shouldn't have to really think about it, at least we saw in, in the people that we interviewed. But as I've said, the public needs bioengineers to engage with the ethics. First of all, it's the bioengineers, at least the genome editing scientists, who are promoting the research that gets the people interested in the first place. Second, I think it's really important to manage public expectations so early trial subjects don't expect cures. Because again, it's, very, it's a psychological phenomenon, but it's created by, you know, we have sociologists and others here, it's created by a communicative context upstream, what people see in the media, what they heard about CRISPR. And third, there's already, as I've said, societal scrutiny focused on researchers, and even in a backlash against science in this country. So there could be, this could really backfire, where transparency and accountability might be able to help us advance science. And fourth, what I haven't focused on as much, but is important, is there is a history of experimentation with vulnerable and oppressed populations that's relevant to CRISPR. And along those lines, one of the main areas that CRISPR is, getting, uh, is being put in, into trials for is sickle cell disease. Here's a quote from Latasha Hoskins-Lee of the National Minority Quality Forum. This new attention from the pharma industry and research organizations has prompted individuals with sickle cell disease to express, to express concerns of future abandonment, that these potentially risky therapies are going to be tested first in sickle cell disease to figure it out on us then go to other diseases, leaving us again with no other options. And uh, the US Health and Human Services said about making science trustworthy, trust must be built on the actions of researchers, not just faith in the benefits of research. 
and has called for shared decision making between researchers and communities defined as those whose participation is necessary for the implementation of the research and whose well-being is likely to be affected by the conduct of research. Okay, I'm going to shift to the radical ethics in a minute. I hope it's clear, it may not be, but I hope it is, why I did the sort of everyday ethics first, because we're basically in trouble to begin with. And we're in trouble before bioengineering. We were in trouble with me medical research. So we have a lot of challenges to begin with. So instead of being really, to me, instead of being like freaked out about how novel bioengineering is, we need to really look at the human context in which all of this science takes place. We need to look at the support and funding that scientists need to survive for us to have advances. Um, so I think understanding the everyday ethics is very important for then looking at the radical ethics. So why do bioengineers need to engage with the radical ethics? Because bioengineering is some areas of it, like I think what Cliff does and what Jennifer Dowden does, is are radically new and very, very promising across the board, but we kind of lack a roadmap for all the things that really new things in bioengineering might bring us. So early decisions in the lab about what to build are also key ethical decisions. Basically, that's the people, the bioengineers, who will be deciding what to build and what not to build in the first place. And no one has a crystal ball of what will happen, but there's this, they have to be part of the team with the decision making in some way. And bioengineering decisions are value laden. What becomes possible will depend on the motives and beliefs of the researchers, consciously or not. And th that's my area, right? I like to look at people's underlying beliefs. Um, and I, there's so many examples of this that I'm happy to discuss, but I, I will just give you a, one. And again, people are so young, I know a lot of people here weren't born, right, when Ronald Reagan was president. I'm just thinking about students and undergraduates. But when Ronald Reagan was president, he got shot in 1981. And um, he survived, but he was injured and it was very frightening. And um, about three years later, he launched this program that we call Star Wars, where he tried to build this kind of universal cosmic shield with all this space money and all this stuff. But it was clearly psychodynamic. You know, he clearly wanted, a I mean, I think, you know, this need for this like absolute protection is sort of a very vivid example of how which technology gets funded can be related to the vulnerabilities of leadership and what, what people have on their mind. So here, let's look at this case study of radical innovation of germline gene editing. Well, first of all, until November 2018, it was universally believed around the world that no one should do germline gene editing. That was all these regulations and policies and everything said that. Then in 2018, Dr. He Zhangqui in China announced the birth of genome edited twins. And this is the headline from Nature. This opened the door for international bodies that had said we should never do germline gene editing to suddenly say, well, someone's done it. Someone, we had, there were other places in Russia and other places where people were starting to do it. What are the rules and regs? Like, when can it be done? When would it be safe? When would it be ethically appropriate? So all these reports came out. The one that focused most on the ethics is the 2018 Nuffield Council report, which does talk about justice and, and informed consent and issues like that. In 2020, we had the National Academy of Science and Medicine consensus report, which really looked more at safety, but also had a poll in it that I'll talk about in a minute. 2021, we had the WHO expert advisory report. Those reports, other than Oviedo, which I'll get to in a minute, those reports all opened the door and said there will be a time for germline gene editing, but we need to meet certain criteria, which I'll get to. The 2021 Oviedo, Oviedo is a <coughs> European human rights-based regulatory council. And they affirmed their 1997 prohibition on germline gene editing, but they did open the door to research in germline gene editing. So these reports, in, in, in our view, provide insufficient ethical guidance. And here's the three areas that they mention, but here's the problems in the way they discuss it. All of them say you would only consider germline gene editing, again, passed on to the future, if it was a very serious disease. But and then they, there's this contrast a lot of people use between treatment and enhancement. And of course, that's based on all kinds of things. Are we just going to have people you know, that are going to be really tall? Are we going to have like racist stereotypes where people are supposed to be blonde and blue-eyed? You know, 
There's all kinds of things that could happen that would be noxious with germline gene editing, but there's, you know, that doesn't, it's not really a, the clear distinction people think between treatment and enhancement. I'm in a school of public health, so we believe that the biggest thing we need to do is prevent serious disease. So germline gene edits, like the one I told you about in my first slide, I talked about a cholesterol gene, PSK9. If we edited that gene, we could save the world from cardiac, most cardiac related disease. Now that seems like pretty serious disease since it's the main cause of death in developed countries, but it would be prevention. So is that treatment or enhancement? And I would say based on my first slide, it depends how we carry it out ethically. If half the people, you know, if 10% of the people get it because they can afford it, and 90% of the world doesn't have it and becomes sort of, you know, lower down in their lives, it looks more like enhancement. But if everybody in the world doesn't get cholesterol related disease, then it starts to look more like in the, in the realm of medical treatment or pr prevention for good medical reasons. This is pretty much, by the way, what happened with statins. Statins were first seen as enhancement, but for all of us on statins now. <laughs> Secondly, they say, well, we should do something about justice and fairness, but there's no really good guidance in any of the guidelines so far. I've already mentioned the economic disparities. With germline gene editing, there'll be very big economic disparities because the, you have to do in vitro fertilization as part of germline gene editing, which is an expensive procedure. Um, so the odds that people who are well off will have much more access are very high. Second of all, people from various disability communities have been writing about their concern that this would not only increase stigma of living a life with a disability, but they're really worried that the funding, such as it is, which is very poor in, in the US for help if you have disabilities, would get even less likely once some people you know, were gene edited. And then third, there's a lot of concern, especially in the black community, given history of eugenic practices, of the risk of its use for eugenics. But anyway, none of that's addressed in the guidelines. But um, the, they also mention community engagement, which is a big part of our work at Berkeley. But people who work in this field, and I know several of you here probably do know, that's its own contentious field of like, how do you do effective community engagement? What really is the way to know what community and communities care about? It's very, very relevant to genetic disease, the problems, because the general public and people affected by diseases usually have very different views. So whose views matter? The general public, people affected by diseases? I mean, even if you give priority to people affected by diseases, which would make sense, there's still public funding, public access, it's, a, it's, it's contentious. And then there's just the fact that we don't really carry out engagement exercises very well. There's all these framing biases, polling biases. So what I found really striking is NASM, the National Academies of Science and Medicine, US's leading um, group, their 2020 um, guidelines, they did this poll where they just asked members of the general public whether they would want to have germline gene editing if they had a serious disease. And 60% of people said yes, but they never said anything about the affordability. And that's a bad poll because they, they needed to say, and it would cost this much, um, or it could cost this much. So, um, but they, we need to know what, this is why I want everything to be contextualized. What do people think about how things are really gonna play out? There's also this really interesting part of the case that, that fascinates me, which is, so I told you there was a, there's a, 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 a physician, actually it's not a physician, I'm sorry I said that. There's, the, there's a researcher in China, Dr. He Zheng Kui, who did the gene line, germline editing of the twins. He was actually trained as a physicist. He was just like the thing at the beginning of my story, just like people like Jennifer Doudna were trained in chemistry, right? So he was trained as a physicist. And what people miss about the case is that the everyday ethics were terrible. I mean, whatever you think about the germline edit, if you start with the everyday ethics, you know this trial should not have happened. What he did should not have happened the way he did it. We have in this country something called the Belmont Report from 1979, which lays out the ethics of research with human subjects. And it's pretty good. Everybody should read it. It's very well written. It's about 20 pages. And um, that is the, 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 the principles behind 
IRBs, if you've had to deal with IRBs at all, this is where those principles come from. And there's three principles that are principles, that are reasoned and based on philosophical and other arguments. It's actually a combined use of utilitarian and deontological. I don't know, I know some philosophers are coming to some stuff. For those there, I'll just throw that out. But um, it's, it, there's a lot of reasoned arguments behind it. But the first principle is respect. I mean, the, 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 there's issues about which of these should outrank which, and there's plenty of uncertainty. But um, it doesn't come out of thin air. So the first principle is respect for persons, where if a person is competent, if it's an adult who's competent, that becomes respect for autonomy. And what happened in this case is um, Dr. Hesheng Kui, basically there was a couple where the man was HIV positive and they wanted to have a pregnancy where they wouldn't give birth to an HIV positive baby. And if you don't have, um, you have for the, for the father transmitting it, there, there's, I actually am just thinking about, since I teach HIV transmission cases all the time, why they didn't have access to, to reducing it pharmaceutically, but whatever. They wanted to have some kind of guarantee that they wouldn't transmit, which we only have about two-thirds efficacy with the drugs we have for a pregnant woman. Um, so I'm trying to think about the dad and the HIV transmission, but they wanted, they wanted not to transmit the HIV to their fetus and then their baby. They, I don't know if they knew at the time they were going to have twins, but they were poor. So basically, um, the first thing about respect for persons is the trial was framed to them as the way that they could prevent HIV in their babies. But the gene edit that was done in this trial is of the CCR5 gene, which is a gene that if you do, ha it's a very important gene. If it's edited, you are likely, if you as, you know, as a sexual adult or whatever, you have sex with someone who's HIV positive, it helps you not contract HIV. It makes you resistant to contracting it. But that, what, the way they do, did the germline gene edit is first they did sperm washing and then they did in vitro fertilization because that's how you do germline gene editing. And the sperm washing itself rid the risk completely of, of you know, up to a very infinitesimal risk that there would be any HIV in the fetus. So if these people could just have afforded to just get sperm washing, they would have, have not had to have a gene edit. They did not understand that. The second ethical standard is beneficence, which is safety. This is what most of the scientific groups talked about, which is the safety had not been established. They didn't, people say that, that the babies could have been chimeras, where you have two different kinds of cells, which can cause health issues. There could have been immunogenicity. They could have made them allergic to some of their own cells. The safety wasn't established when they did it. And then third, this was a, tr a couple that couldn't otherwise afford the sperm washing. And so this was their only way to clear the HIV was to be in a trial where way after the sperm washing they had to go through germline gene editing. So they were a vulnerable group. So to me this was a missed opportunity to ad address these basic gaps in ethics education in bioengineering. Dr. Hez, I said, was a biophysicist and he had done no prior research with human subjects. He went right from the lab to doing this. And so what happened is the world labeled him a rogue actor. He went to jail. He, I think he just got out of jail about a month ago. But what we know is he consulted with experts at leading universities, including Rice and Stanford. And those people didn't identify. They looked at his informed consent process. They looked at the whole thing. And they didn't see any serious violations. I just want to remind everybody that we have, since 1975, an international standard for the rights of research subjects that has never been reduced, which is the, the World Medical Association Declaration of Helsinki. While the primary purpose of medical research is to generate new knowledge, this goal can never take precedence over the rights and interests of individual research subjects. So we've argued for the importance of a human rights approach, and there's a very concrete way to do it using a human rights impact assessment. And we've argued for using that for germline gene editing. And basically, this includes individual and collective rights, the interest of society in research and having research progress. And we believe bioengineers could play a really important role as experts in these impact assessments, the way civil engineers and nuclear en engineers contribute to impact assessments in their fields. And this is not just technical. It requires in-depth understanding of the bioethical and societal concerns. It requires interdisciplinary education. Scientific education needs to make space for interdisciplinarity. That means getting tenure and promoted. 
needs to make space for that in some way. You know, you have to get credit for the time you take because if you're constantly having to publish in your lab all the time and there's no time for that, you can't do it. Um, and leadership needs to model it. That requires depth collaboration with humanities and social sciences. And the humanities and social science people have to really understand the science to make recommendations or work with people without understanding it does a complete injustice to science. We need funding for that. And then we need the expertise to develop really effective and representative community engagement, which is a huge challenge in and of itself. So this is my last slide. I just wrote a few things we could talk about, but I'm really interested in anything anyone wants to say or ask. How can bioengineers engage in the bioethics? There's really no time in the way careers are structured right now. And there's no, no reward incentive structure for it, of what you get promoted for what, and how you get funding. I, and that's a huge part of it. So how do we really build in the value of the time this takes? How do we have team models? It's not like everybody's going to be as expert in everything. It, it's, um, Dave, I give David credit for saying, it's the question, you know, maybe the, it's not that the bioengineers have, to, nobody knows the answer to all the ethical questions, but it's not even so much about knowing all the answers as asking the right questions upstream. So there are team models. Some people ask some of the questions, some people do some of the ethics research or sociologic research, but it's gotta be with the eye of the PI on the, on the importance of the work. Um, and then in terms of public engagement, I think that's an even harder set of issues. Who decides, is it society overall? Is it affected populations? It's very contentious, who decides? Um, is societal consensus an impossible dream in a country as divided as ours? And then my own thing is that becoming aware, I say can becoming aware of scientists' biases and motives. Again, everybody has biases and motives, but that might shape their products. Can that lead to better decisions and more public trust? Thank you. I heard after bioengineers, I couldn't hear. Maybe go a little slower. What was the route that civil engineering and nuclear engineering took to involve themselves in those standards? And is that something that bioengineering could do? Because bioengineering is very multifaceted in some ways, but I feel like we could still come together. And I don't actually know the history of how those other disciplines created that role for themselves. It's a great question, and I'm, I'm not an expert on the history. There probably are people here who are, but as um, Penelope was saying today, you know, civ civil engineering, you know, you're building bridges, so you can't really be even, a, even a, you know, moderately responsible civil engineer without thinking about people and communities. So um, that field kind of builds it in a lot, but nuclear engineers it's, was so contentious, but when you look at, when you read about the different folks who serve on various nuclear assessments internationally to keep to try to keep us safe there's a lot of engineering time going into that where people became experts because of how dangerous um, nuclear technologies could be if we didn't have people who really understand the science playing a role in the ethics and societal part thanks hi my name is i'm director of the university center for human values um, I wanted to ask about uh, the role that could be played by journals in sort of resetting the norms. So you mentioned tenure and funding norms, but I was thinking of Michael Strevin's reflections on philosophy of science that really emphasize the public way scientists argue. And so I, I wondered if you know, journals could sort of set a kind of quota or expectation for the way in which ethics has to be engaged in their pages and if that, if that could be that's a great idea. I think that is a very good way because getting published is, that is the currency. So that just seems like a, an exact point of intervention, Melissa. I think that's great. Yeah. And I'm a, an alum of the Center for Human Values. <laughs> but it was a great, it really, I got to spend a year here 24 years ago and it was incredibly supportive of my development.
can you can you say more about uh, your thoughts on the last point about thoughts you might have for how scientists and humanists can do more to re-engage the public to build more public trust for science in this country? Well, I think. There's so, I mean, and that's part of what we're sort of researching at Berkeley with our Kavli Center now. But I think that um, at least one thing is to not engage in hype. You know, I mean, what would happen if all scientists agreed not to overhype? You know, I know if, if the scientists are all laughing. I don't even know how you'd write a grant application. You know, this is really important stuff, and we hope it could lead to whatever things, but it'll take. I, you know, one way that you could probably educate, and maybe if, the problem is it's, it's one of those cooperation problems, because you don't want to be the, the person who doesn't get the grant, because you're like the last honest person. But um, it is related to like what Melissa's saying, the journals could probably play a role there. But I really think creating unrealistic expectations upstream is part of the problem. So I think that if the public was used to very um, kind of understated communication about science, and I'm actually looking at some folks who I think do that, but a lot of it is about the timeline. A lot, I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, this is a fundamental discovery that will eventually make a huge difference in the world. But being really honest about the timelines would be incredibly different. So some of it is not getting the public too confused in the first place. Um, but then, you know, we live in a, I really like the, the journal thing and debates, but we do live in a country right now with misinformation, disinformation. I, I mean, I will say, I was, <laughs> I'll just be honest, I said, what can anybody get out of my talks and my two-day visit? You know, basically vote. <laughs> like really what everything about science and the future of ethics and science is going to depend about the future, you know, at least in the U.S., the future of this country. And whether we have honest information and whether we have a public, right now we've got the public so afraid and confused about science. I mean, so there's so many things about, you know, public communication and honesty. Scientists really have extra pressure on them to to you know model integrity because of that, but that, and that might be necessary but not sufficient. Um, and then in terms of what specific models, like methodologically of community engagement, there's a lot of different models, but I'm the one that really has impressed me is a model in um, the UK and Holland, where part of it's like jury duty. Basically, you get tapped like jury duty to be on these decision-making bodies about particular specific contextualized bioethical decisions. And it's been very successful. I've talked to some of the people who've been in them, some of the people who've led them. So there'd be like this, I guess what we need is society. You know, society sometimes only cares about things when they become sensationalized and when there's a lot of out outrage. And my work is really about emotions driving everything. And so it'd be nice to have it be more sort of everyday part of, you know, science is a very important part of making a better future for everyone, but everyone has to participate and have it be kind of like a, you know, a civic duty. Um, those are models I particularly like. Hi, so I, I, I'm a bioengineer, but I don't work with germline editing. I also don't work with therapeutics. And I can't see myself working in these topics that are more clearly or imminently related to bioethical questions. And I was wondering how I should, or people who are in my shoes, should approach this question when it's the question itself isn't very evident. You know, and I would love to spend 15 minutes and hear about your work, and then I could see, I mean, you could talk to people in other fields that might help you think about if there are any things in your field that are relevant or interesting, because you're just a very, folks here are very intellectually curious across the board. So it sounds like you can sort of begin in a kind of relaxed way because you don't see some imminent huge problem. Um, but learning, like I don't, I'd have to ask what, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'd have to ask you what you work on and how, yeah, you want? Okay, and, and um, now I can look at the people that wouldn't, I mean, I know what that means, but I'm just thinking like what would that, I mean, because I'm thinking that can even, I know that can relate to brain science a lot, right? So like what are the different things that, you're, you're saying you're going to stay in the lab the rest of your life, is what you're saying, pretty much? Um, yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, I think that just even being here to hear this talk and thinking about it, I'm sure there are reasons for you to think about it upstream. But I think, I think that um, 
cellular migration sounds to me like something that is going to become quite applied in various ways when the science allows for it. And you could be, I mean, actually more impartial expertise is even more valuable. You would, if you had no conflict of interest directly, you could be like a great person to think about this stuff and participate in impact assessments and stuff because you could understand the science and not deal with the fact that it could put your own livelihood at stake. So I'd say it's still part of your field and you could play a especially impartial role. Hi, thanks for the lecture, really great. Uh, so you talked a bit about how uh, we need to start improving the way that scientists communicate with the public in order to better inform them. And also we talked a little bit about uh, one issue with bioethics is that scientists are too optimistic about the benefits of their research and they're sort of ignorant of the negative consequences of their research. Or, the, or they're put in a position for, I think scientists are pretty smart. So, I mean, depending on the person, but no, seriously, some are brilliant and some could be narrow-minded about conflicts so they could have defense mechanisms. But a lot of the people we talked to had a complex awareness, but what they, what they thought about the complexity, they really felt like, I can't take this on. Right, so on that note, I wanted to ask if you thought that ethics should be included in the uh, basic curriculum of scientists as they're being educated. Yes. So in the same way that like, math is taught in middle school because it's a very fundamental part for all science going forward. When and how would you introduce ethics into the conversation? Like, do you teach philosophy to physicists? Yeah, well, I mean, actually, I think it's a great question. And I think that ethics education, given like the way we are as a society and the way we treat each other, I think non-scientists need it too. You know, just part of being an educated person, and I do think it should be probably middle school, high school, you know, I mean, hopefully we're even in grade school, we're modeling, treating the other kids with respect and not bullying and, but you know, more and more thinking about it over time. I have, you know, a philosophy background, but I'm very, I'm very um, attracted to an interdisciplinary approach to ethics because of this emphasis on context that I was um, talking about. So I think knowing some different ethical systems and how they, play out and how to think is part of what people need to know, but a lot of what they need to think about is, you know, the history of treatment of human subjects, the obligations, the standards, and what, you know, the complexity, you know, questions, questions and challenges and become, I don't want to give David all his ideas that he gave me today, but they were fabulous, but sort of building the, the capacity to think about hard problems, just like we need a capacity to think about hard problems in science. Great, thank you. Thanks. Any last burning questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering if you had any advice for younger students, especially like undergraduates or early graduate students, um, about because I've noticed a lot of these like changes seem like they would um, should directly come from like, these principal investigators or like even like the FDA or like the NIH. And what can people like? younger people who haven't even entered into this field much and don't have the influence or power to, because a lot of times we have to choose and we don't really get that many choices of where to work with, who to work with, like, and what to work on. So what can we do now to like better navigate our future in this room? That's a great question. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I, I think that, um, first of all, I mean, different schools are different, but I mean, I was, I think that at a place like Princeton, and I could be wrong. I mean I, I mean, I mean, I was here many, many years ago and I was never an undergrad here. But um, I think this is true at Berkeley too. Faculty like me, however old we are, if I'm, I'm probably at least as sensitive to shame dynamics or positive self feelings that I'm a good person as I am to money issues. So I think faculty do not want to feel that students don't respect them. So I think students have the power of their respect and regard. Um, and not to do anything negative. I mean, we have enough negative. I'm super not into like internet shaming or anything. Like I'm so against all of that. I, I think it's like ruining our society. So not to pick, I mean, it's much easier to complain about someone, but what about helping people develop good reputations who do do more of this or asking for it? You can always join with several students, you know, in a lab and you can do it across ages. Like you don't have to be the lone undergrad. You could do it with the grad students. You could go to groups like the group we have at Berkeley I'm sure Princeton has groups like that. And just sort of, um, and do it as a curiosity thing, as an engagement thing. Like we're learning so much about science from you 
and we realize, you know, we hear these lectures about all these complex issues. Can we make that part of what we discuss together or learn about with you? Or, I mean, I think you can, I think students have more power to affect people than, but it is a power issue at a, at a broad level. I mean, it's not like it's not a problem. Okay, um, before we let everybody go down the hall to enjoy the uh, wine and cheese, uh, I just want to present Jody with a memento of our oh. together. <laughs>